You may not be able to control the things that I was saying, that are damaging your mental health, that are um, making it hard for you to live a good life. But you can control your reactions to those things and you can learn to develop better coping strategies so that you can handle those things in a healthy way. If, if you have somebody in your life who's struggling with a mental health issue, empathy is a big deal. Um, when somebody comes up and says, uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sad or I'm going through the transit because of this thing that didn't happen or this thing that happened and I'm feeling really down, I don't know how to handle this thing. Your first answer should not be, but look at your life, mm -hmm. you're so happy, mm -hmm. you have so many things going on. So if you're waiting for external motivation to constantly be there so that you can do things, you will find yourself uh, falling behind on a lot of your goals in life because motivation does not care about you and motivation is very short lived. Mm -hmm. Motivation uh, does not sustain you. It's work that's it. Consistency is what sustains you. Motivation just can get you started, but it's not a requirement. So I think we give a lot of power to motivation that it does not deserve. Welcome to the Shuja Fitcast. My name is Kaneki Kamawe, and we are here once again to have more engaging conversations surrounding health, fitness, wellness. Um, today is a bit of a change in gear. Uh, it's because mainly what I believe is that when we talk about physical health, uh, well-being, there's a tendency for us to overemphasize the physical side of things. And just generally in life, we tend to focus on what we can see and touch and hear and taste and smell. But there's an aspect of life that we can often overlook, and that's our mental health. Uh, of course, that's a conversation that's become very popular today. Um, but I thought that it would be really helpful to have someone who is well-versed in that particular line of work. And hopefully this conversation will help you have better a better understanding, a more well-rounded well-rounded understanding of how our lives can be holistically healthy. Um, so we have a guest with us today who is going to help us along that journey in that conversation. And I'm so privileged to have Jennifer Chalo here with us today. Karibu sana. Thank you. Um, you are a mental health expert and amongst other things, mm -hmm. then you'll tell us a bit more about the work you do. Uh, but thank you so much for coming through. Um, tell us a bit about who you are, um, your professional background, uh, what, what got you into this work surrounding mental health, um, all that good stuff. Ah, okay. So thank you so much for having me. I am excited and happy to be here. I am Jennifer Chalo, and I am a casting psychologist. Um, again, among other things, I am a writer, I'm an author, um, I am a podcast host, I guess. Yeah, I do my own mental health stuff on the side as well. So yeah, um, a lot of those things. And um, I am the founder in, uh, of Infinity Wellness Consultants in Safe Space Arena, which are two organizations that focus a lot on mental health. So both of them have different mandates. We do different things on both uh, platforms. Um, for Infinity Wellness Consultants, we do a lot of... Um, mental health support for individuals and for, for, for corporates. So we offer um, wellness services to employers and to employees. Uh, we have other professionals within the organizations. We have uh, child therapists, we have married and family therapists, we have occupational therapists. So we have a bunch of people who can help you with whatever need you have. So that is the French wellness consultants. And we also do the uh, professionals network. So we have a mental health platform where we talk about, we talk to mental health professionals about the work they do and why they do it, so that we can answer the question of what we are therapists. Because every time I meet people, they're like, hey, we are these therapists, mm -hmm. not the counselors. So I got tired of hearing that and I was like, okay, fine, I'm just going to bring them together and I'll go. So you can check out and finish wellness consultants if you're looking for a counselor. And also if, uh, for mental health professionals to collaborate with each other and to work with each other and to partner. Because um, there are counselors who are out there, they have projects they're so passionate about and they need uh, support on those projects and they don't know who to collaborate with. So that's where Infinity Wellness comes uh, in place. And so we work together with you, we connect you to other mental health professionals, if you're a client, we connect you to a therapist. And yeah, you can watch the videos and see if there's one that you click with, and that will be awesome. Um, on the other hand, we have Safe Space Arena, which is my baby. And um, on that platform, we do a lot of three things. One is support for beginner therapists, advice and consultation, 
in anything that a medical therapist would need for them to succeed in the field, mm-hmm. and especially people who are looking into getting into the private practice. So we offer support in that sense, and yeah, if you're a beginner therapist, that's the, pl- that's the platform to check out. We have a bunch of YouTube videos. We are constantly answering questions. There's always someone to respond to your DMs. Um, the other thing we do is support for creatives. So we of- we have a podcast for creatives called Conversations with the Therapist and the Therapist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And yeah, we, we talk to creatives about the realities of being a creative in Kenya, how it works, how it goes, how um, they feel about their mental health in that in that field, what creativity does for them. Yeah, and we share personal stories because there, there's a lot of stuff that goes on into being creative and it can be ignored because of the glamour that is that comes with being a celebrity of some sort. So we do that and offer of course therapy for them. If there's a creative out there looking for therapy, uh, it's a platform that you can get a therapist. And yeah, last but definitely not least, we also share mental health resources, um, factual information, curating content, creating content. Um, we try to find uh, informative content from around the internet and put it on one place so that you don't have to look too far. Um, there's a lot of information that is scattered all over the place, and our, our work is trying to bring it together. Factual information, informative information to make sure that you don't um, struggle looking for what you need. It's all in one place. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what I do on in my spare time. And beyond that, I read books and I just share. Yeah. Yeah. But so going back to why why in the first place, why why did you choose this line of work? Uh, why are you so passionate about this type of issues? <sighs> There's a lot. Um, but my main my main reason for wanting to become a mental health professional is because um, I realize how unseen many people feel and how loneliness can get in the way and how people feel that they are going through the human condition by themselves. And so my attempt has always been, from the very beginning, has always been trying to make life less lonely. So I know when you come to therapy, yes, I'm your, uh, I'm your therapist, we can't be friends, but at least you get to have somebody who sees you and hears you, the real you, not the one that you have to create for the world to see. So my, my, um, my goal, my passion lies in making life less lonely <laughs> for people and I know sometimes that feels uh, strange because I'm getting paid to do it. Mm. Uh, when you come to therapy you're paying for the services but at the end of the day it doesn't invalidate the work that I do. So my, my desire for becoming a mental health professional is because I, I realize that life can be very lonely and life can be very, um, well, that loneliness can be very damaging to mental health in general and, and, and it, it makes you an, uh, an emotional dwarf not being able to connect with other people. You are there and you are no one and yeah my, my desire is to make that a less lonely journey than it should be. Mm. And that's how I ended up becoming a mental health professional. And you wanted to be in the helping profession for sure. Because I remember I was even checking out about becoming a nurse, a paramedic, mm. um, things that would get me closer to people. And then I ended up finding counseling and I was like, yeah, maybe this is the one. Maybe this could be the one. But yeah, I'm still open to exploring new things. And yeah. You never know. That's pretty cool. That's, that's helpful. I think uh, what you said about loneliness being damaging is is very true and and then you use the phrase emotional dwarf which is so it's 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 a strong statement but i think it's very it's very accurate yeah because when you encounter a situation where someone hasn't someone has been stifled on that level of things maybe through circumstance or where you are born whatever happened in your life it's evident when people are not allowed to deal with that side of who they are mm-hmm. that there's a lot of negative outbursts or outcomes in the in the real world that happen. And I think that's another reason why this conversation is so important. Um, so we'll get right into that conversation <laughs> yeah. uh, in a minute, just mm-hmm. after we learn a bit more about you. So maybe some of your uh, work history as it relates to psychology, overall journey throughout your profession, yeah. um, some of the key learning moments that you've had um, that would benefit people listening. Yeah, um, there's, there's a, uh, I, think, I think being a mental health professional, you get to work with so many people, sometimes it can come lie where exactly you lie. So, um, for example, I've, I've done a lot of work in um, individual therapy, of course, I've been in therapy practice for a while, and I work with all sorts of people mostly people from 18 and above for different issues. Uh, most of them is, I was telling somebody just the other day, I think my work is getting people unstuck because the clients that I get to deal with most of the time is usually clients who feel stuck and they're stuck in a transition somewhere. 
So there's people who are, maybe you're just cleared high school, you're going to campus, you're confused. Or you're just cleared campus and you're getting into the world and you're confused. Or you're feeling stuck. Or you've been in the workplace for a while and you're getting in your 40s and you're thinking, is this it? Is, is there more to life than this? So I find myself working a lot with people who are feeling stuck. Um, I've worked in, I've done a lot of workplace counseling, so employee wellness and things like that. Um, yeah, I've been a founder, I've been a founder of mental health, uh, spaces and talking about these things. Writing has been part of the things that I do, uh, consulting for mental health professionals who are looking into, um, understanding how to become better therapists for their clients. That is a lot of the work that I've been doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I studied testing psychology, uh, in case that is not obvious, I studied testing psychology and, um, the key learning, again, it comes back to what I mentioned in the beginning. We are all looking for love and belonging. And I can tell you that that is the trend that I've seen in all my clients that I have worked with. I don't think there's one that I have not met who is not, um, is, is not running somewhere along that thread. We are looking for love and belonging. And um, everything we do on a daily basis is going to either be an attempt to get that love and belonging or an attempt to deal with the pain of not getting that love and belonging. And it's rare that we do any other thing beyond that. Because it's either you have it or you have pain. Mm. And there's nothing as uncomfortable as emotional pain. Mm. Physical pain, you know, you can take the killers and stuff, but then emotional pain is very difficult. And so we try to numb stuff mm. with different forms of addiction, including pain. Mm. Yeah, that's <laughs> just fine, but yes. that's why we're here to yeah. yeah, yeah, we, we, we numb, we numb the, 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 the running away from that lack of love and belonging is going to drive you into getting into things that are damaging to you. So you find yourself um, yeah, using one thing or another. It could be drugs, it could be any kind of addiction, it could be fitness, it could be food, it could be shopping, it could be spending money, it could be running away through distractions, your phone, internet, TV. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. distraction is a thing. It's real because, and like I had mentioned to you, the reason I started this show was because I think that's something you don't we're not very open to addressing the fitness world yeah. uh, because fitness is all about looking strong at your best, mm-hmm. uh, being in tip-top shape and whatnot. And I think what goes unaddressed a lot of times is the fact that there's a lot of us who are seeking that love and belonging you're talking about by maybe being big and strong because you felt small and weak when you were young, like myself. Um, but it's something that you have to... I believe you have to deal with before you get into truly addressing your health and fitness in a more sustainable way. Yeah. Because if you continue down the path of seeking that love and belonging by trying to get a six pack or trying to diet perfectly or trying to exercise perfectly, you end up damaging yourself in yep. the long run. Yeah. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um people will do anything to um handle pain. Whatever it is, they will wish to get rid of emotional pain. Mm-hmm. And that can come in very many forms. Some of them look healthy on the side, but they are eventually you've not dealt with the space that is in there that you're trying to follow up. Mm-hmm. And if you're not, all these things will be bandits. Mm-hmm. And then the real lot and the thing that actually sorts yeah. the problem. The yeah. Real, the real affirmation. Yeah. But how do you help people get healthier? Um mentally healthier, I think that's where I start because uh, the work is mental health. But then the the there's a ripple effect. When your mental health is in a good place, most of other things in life will go mm-hmm. will go well. So, um, the first thing that I, I help people uh, deal with them, the first way that I help people get healthier, is um, helping them gain insight into who they are and why they do the things they do, and they become. I encourage all my clients to become curious and observant of themselves. So, I want everybody who I work with to consider themselves their own lab rats. Mm-hmm. Just stand back and watch yourself and become aware of who you are. Uh, become so keen on things you do, where you do them. And oh, if, if you do them for X, Y, and Z reason, is that the best way to address those issues? So um, I encourage my clients to become self-aware because I believe self-awareness is the first thing. That's the first step. It's like a, it's like a Swiss army knife. It's the one that gets you to deal with everything else. So self-awareness is a big deal. I help my clients develop self-awareness. Um, I help them gain an insight into their lives. I help them um, learn to cope with difficult situations because um, there's a lot in the world that is painful and disturbing and it won't go away because you want it to go away and the world will continue rotating as it is and so you you may not be able to control the things that are, that are saying that are damaging your mental health that are um, making it hard for you to live a good life but you can control your reactions to those things and you can learn to develop better coping strategies so that you can handle those things in a healthy way.
so that you're not a reactive person. You, you, you are able to stand back and think and, and assess situations and make better decisions. Mm. Um, something else that um, I help um, with, with the clients do is get out of autopilot. So when it comes to self-awareness again, you, self-awareness will enable you, enable you to get out of autopilot. You're not just doing things because of an unconscious drive. So trying to help my clients understand the things that drive them to do the things that they do. That is an important part of the work. Otherwise, you're going to be um, just doing things over and over again, but you never know why, and you never know what purpose they serve. And it just becomes a repetitive pattern that is damaging sometimes. Uh, you could be repeating patterns from your childhood, patterns that were passed on to you by parents mm-hmm. or caregivers of any sort. And so, yeah, being able to get out of that autopilot, I think, is quite important. Um, I like to help clients also um, discover their own values so that they can make decisions and goals that align with those values. Um, so basically, this is around discovering your why, your purpose for living, your purpose for being, um, so that you don't just do things for the sake of doing things. Remember, it's very possible when you're out here to start chasing goals that are not your goals. Mm-hmm. And you're chasing goals that have been set out by society, goals yeah. that have been set out by your peers, yeah. uh, goals that have been set out by people who are like you in one way or another. So you're like, people like me do these kinds of things, and so I have to do those kinds of things, whether I want them or not, whether they align with my values or not. So, um, Lack of awareness on your values can make you keep chasing outside goals that do not serve you any purpose. They're just things you do because you think that you should. So I try to make my clients understand what their values are so that um, when they're creating goals, those goals are in line with their values and then they become easier goals to meet. Mm-hmm. Even if it's going to take some time, it's an easier goal because you constantly know why you're doing things you do. Mm-hmm. And I think having a sense of why is very important in life. Otherwise, uh, you just end up going away, you're just doing things and yeah, you have no direction in yeah. purpose. Um, and definitely, last but not least, all these things wrap up into healthy relationships. Um, I want my clients to have healthy relationships with everybody yeah, with parents, family, friends, uh, colleagues at work, people they meet on the streets. Um, when you're working on yourself, when you become even developing a better relationship with yourself. So um, when you're working on yourself, it's very easy for you to for the for the results that come out of you working on yourself can be seen in interactions with other people. So when my clients get better at dealing with themselves, with their own self-talk, with their own um, mental health, with their own um, love for themselves, with their own purpose, with their own values, when they become better at these things, they are able to sh- become like a light to other people. So when people meet you, they're going to be like, hey, but you, you're kind of different. Um, you might not give, tell them anything big or major, but they'll be like, you're kind of different. There's something about you. And it's because you're working on yourself. So I try to make my clients, um, I try to help my clients work on themselves so that they become better for themselves and then that translates to them being better people for the for, for better people in their lives. So yeah, that's a ninety percent of the work. Yeah. Um but most of it is done by the client of course. Mm-hmm. I'm just a facilitator, mm-hmm. a very small part in their lives. Yeah. And I help with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Self awareness is yeah. huge. Um it's huge also because yeah, just the way you described it is so helpful. The Swiss Army knife analogy you used because I find myself using that phrase self-awareness a lot yeah. because I have found in my personal journey that knowing my why and knowing uh, the background noise that mm. is informing some of the things I do, yeah. and some of the things I've done has been so helpful in the next steps forward, uh, which is again why I think the work you do is so important. and something that is not that common in our society today. So I'm really, really excited to get into this conversation. Yeah, um, um, it, this, 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 it's very possible to find yourself in that noise, getting lost in that noise, because right now there's a lot of noise. So it's upon you to, to, to learn how to detect the signal. And so um, knowing self-awareness helps you detect signal in the midst of noise. And so I think that is why self-awareness is the, one of the biggest parts of being a uh, functioning human being. If you don't know yourself, you are you are in the dark. Mm-hmm. You're working in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. It's very so. difficult. <laughs> yeah. So now that we've we've kind of laid the, the, the foundation, uh, could you help us understand what mental health is in the first place? We use that today it's a buzzword. Yeah. The, the buzzwords, mental health, everyone's talking about mental mental health. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Um, I'm gonna go with uh, the WHO and other big organizations that have defined it which is psychological, emotional, and social well-being. So those are three aspects. And of course, um, when you look at WHO's uh, definition for um, health, development of health in general, it's that uh, 
the, there are several elements that help you become healthy. It's not necessarily the absence of uh, disease, but there are some aspects that make it a better situation for you. So having uh, psychological well-being, having uh, emotional well-being, having uh, social well-being, those are big, big aspects. Having financial well-being that is important. But for uh, mental health specifically, psychological, emotional, and um, social well-being. And those three aspects help you determine uh, the way you act, the way you think, the way you uh, feel. And mental health has a lot to do with those three things because those three things are very connected to each other and they influence each other. So how you're feeling can highly, highly affect how you start behaving. And it can highly, highly affect how you start thinking about yourself and the world and your perception of the world. So that's why with uh, mental health, those three things are key. Yes. So um, social, of course, is to do with the relationships you have, uh, the places you are in, uh, the interactions you have with people, and how they affect you. All that is important. Your emotions, having a handle on them, making sure that you are not all over the place. Um, and of course, handling emotions is not a uh, stepping emotions. It's not shutting them down. Can go. No, no, no. <laughs> that is not handling emotions. <laughs> handling emotions is making sure they don't get out of hand. Mm. Yeah. So and and yeah, psychological. Just reports your your psychological processes. Um, that is important for your mental health. Uh, because at the end of the day, how you think, act, and behave. That is a big. How you think, act, and feel. Those are those are important aspects of of uh, being healthy mentally. And if they are out of place. You are going to experience a lot of pain and suffering mm. unnecessarily. Mm. Yeah. 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 That's helpful. And so, what uh, I think you've kind of touched on it the, the signs of a mentally healthy person, would, I guess, would now mean someone who's found a good place within those three things that you've yeah. pointed out. Yeah, that is, that is very important because, um, again, if that is the definition, then those three aspects are really important. They would not be put there for no reason, mm. right? And um, the thing that people who are Mentally healthy are people who can handle the daily stresses of life. They don't get overwhelmed by daily stresses of life because life will always be stressful. There's always going to be something. A healthy person, okay, so think about stress this way. When you're crossing the road, you need a bit of stress so that you can be keen and sharp mm. and look both directions. Um, if it's Nairobi, you have to look both directions. Up and down. <laughs> and make sure nothing, no one is coming from the sky. Yeah. So um, a healthy person has that level of stress where they can know what they need to do in that situation because uh, you, you are lax, and then they can cross the road without too much fear and anxiety. And an emotionally healthy person, the road will be an anxiety inducing place where they cannot cross at all. Mm. So you can see that unhealthy stress holds you back. Mm. Healthy stress help, helps you move forward. Mm. So um, a mentally healthy person can handle those small stresses of life. Sometimes they seem big, depending on where you are, but most of the time they are not that major. Um, an emotionally healthy person can see through emotions, both positive and negative. So um, they don't they don't feel like uh, when, when things are too good, they don't start uh, getting too excited to a point where they cannot do their daily tasks, they cannot take care of themselves. When the things are really bad, they don't get to a place where they can no longer work, they can no longer contribute to society. Those are parts of life and they are able to regulate themselves. So they can see through emotion and they don't take it as a sign that they are weak or they are bad or they are falling apart. Yeah, they, personalizes. yeah, they realize that emotions are emotions. They come and they go. And I am a person and I will remain here after the emotions are gone. And that is totally okay. And I am good to handle these emotions when they come up. So that is an emotionally healthy person. Um, an emotionally healthy person is also one who can handle criticism of themselves and of others. So it's people who are not very pessimistic. They can see um, things for what they are. They are very cautious. They don't um, assume that everything is a catastrophe mm -hmm. when it is not. Mm -hmm. So that's an emotionally healthy person. And um, they can handle life changes with ease. Not necessarily that life changes will not um, affect them, but but even when they get affected, they know that they can still handle the situation. So again, it's not about um, numbing your situation. It's about um, being aware of them and being able to navigate. And that is a sign of emotional health. Um, I think uh, definitely... Um, the last but definitely important thing about emotional health is objectivity. People who are emotionally healthy are very objective and they don't act from emotional emotion. They don't give emotional reactions to everything all the time. They know when to act emotionally and they know when to pause and think objectively and make rational decisions. And that is a marker of emotional health. Because otherwise you are acting emotionally and then things go where you do. Because emotions are temporary. Emotions are not facts. Emotions can go. And if you're acting on emotions, then it means you're constantly 
agitated and took constantly Amelo. Mm. And that is not that stable enough for you to your the neurotic side of things mm. now. Yeah, mm. that can be disturbing too. Yeah. Yeah. That's helpful. And and I guess in line with that the unhealthy person like you said now would be the, the inverse of, of all those things. Yeah. Um why in your opinion why would you say the the conversation around mental health is important? Um, because there's no health without mental health. <laughs> That's like the only legit answer. Mm. There's no health. So it's not something um, that school kids just started talking about on social media. I wish it was, <laughs> but it is it unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe without, there's no health without mental health. Mm. If you are numb and apathetic, which is a real sign of uh, mental unhealthy, unhealthiness. Yeah, I say mental unhealthiness mm. is, is numbness and apathy. If you're numb and apathetic, you can't do anything in your life mm. because you do not have any desire to do anything. You will not take care of yourself mm. and you're going to be harmful to yourself and to other people because you do not care about anything. Mm. And your mental health is is um mm. like a like um it's like a cushion between you and the dark side and it's the one that helps you become a functioning member of the society. Mm. And it's also the thing that helps you take care of yourself. So if you're not interested in any of those things, then you become a danger to yourself and to other people. Mm. And that is not a good place to be. Yeah. yeah so Correct. that's why we need to have this conversation because there's really no health protection to mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what factors do you think have contributed to the rise in this discussion today? Um, you can also help us maybe with some statistics and findings from your research which highlight why. Because it's something I think, I think all of us can acknowledge that we've had the word mental health way more in like the last maybe five to ten years than we ever had before that. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the reasons? I think the big one is because, first of all, the world has become a global village. Uh, we have technology now in a bigger way than we did in the past. And the, the thing about technology is that now everybody has access to that information. So word travels very fast. Um, if I see something interesting, I want to share it to a friend. And so this sharing of back and forth of information has been constant in the last couple of years because of now technology and everything. So there's a lot of that sharing, that, that information that is in the, question, in, the, in the collective conscious. Everybody, not everybody, but most people are, like, are aware of these things. And beyond that, there's also the, um, the interest, the global interest in mental health. So when the World Health Organization talks about depression being one of the big problems in the country, one or not in the country, but globally. It's a, it's a burden of disease. Mm-hmm. It's a contributor to the burden of disease. Uh, that becomes something, because now, if the World Health Organization is saying it, it means that everybody has to listen. Mm-hmm. Governments have to listen. Governments have to do things. And so uh, that interest in, in the topic by uh, bigger powers has made it a bigger conversation. Um, I think people are also very open to talking about it. Uh, Guys are very open to sharing their inter- their stories. Um, sometimes it's not even like sharing the entire story, but they will sit up and speak up when there's a conversation about mental health. And so um, people are, are able to speak up, and when you hear a story, you tell another person, and the person sees the story, and we all share our experiences. And above that, it's I think it's the issue with the suicide. Mm-hmm. Suicide has become a big deal. Uh, a big deal. It's um, suicide is right now considered the second killer in the world for 10 to 20 to 14 year olds and what? 25 to 34 year olds second what's first and intentional injuries wow. yeah what? like something just happened to you but mm-hmm. you got and you died yeah the second one is suicide wow. but then now the case between the 14 and the 24 year olds for them it's homicide mm-hmm. they are killing each other wow. or getting killed by people so uh suicide has become a big conversation and so um when people are taking their lives uh, in that at that rate, and especially kids, mm-hmm. ten to fourteen, that's a child. Mm-hmm. Um, when when twenty five to thirty four year olds are killing themselves, mm-hmm. that is scary, and it has to be put in the forefront so that um, we can see what can be done. Yeah. So I think just the conversation being so global right now, mm-hmm. it's impossible for it not to be yeah. something. Yeah. Everybody is involved, and then now when you start realizing that oh, not everyone is suffering, mm-hmm. you're ready to talk about it. Yeah, it becomes easier to have the conversation. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the reasons maybe why we didn't talk too much about it before? And because we didn't talk about it as much, people have been emotional dwarfs for a long time. <laughs> and then now that we're killing ourselves, yeah. and now there's a red flag. So 
what are these things that made us so uncomfortable about talking about our mental health before? Yeah, actually, even before I answer that, let me just make a clarification that just because this is a global conversation does not mean that it is a thing that we are talking about as much as we need to. This, what what caused us not to talk about it back in the day as much as we do right now is shame and stigma and judgments, and it is still there up today. There are so many people who will not talk about their mental health journeys at all. Mm-hmm. They are not willing to wear up. Families that will not open up at all uh, because uh, of the shame, stigma, and the judgments. People are afraid of losing um, whatever status they think they have if they open up about their struggle. Mm-hmm. So um, it's still, I, I know being in the in social media, we are in a bubble. Mm-hmm. And when you see your 5,000 followers talking about mental health, you think that, oh my gosh, it's a thing. Mm-hmm. It's not. That is just a very small bubble. Remember, like Kenya has over 50 million people. I can promise you, over half of them do not know anything about mental health. Mm. Yeah, and they are not on social media. Mm. So um, let's not be deceived by the bubble of social media that this is a conversation that is being had. It's not. It is still at its at its infancy. There's a lot of people who don't know anything about mental health. I uh, just drive a kilometer. Uh, just drive an hour out of Nairobi and go talk to somebody. Just a random guy on the market yeah. and ask them something about mental health. And you realize that your social media bubble lies to you. Mm-hmm. People are not as conversant as you think they are. Yeah. And it's the shame, it's the stigma, it's the Kwanino and Yawatu, she does a familiar. Mm-hmm. Why are you telling bringing people inside things they should not be knowing? Uh, keep quiet, you know, there's a lot of that. Yeah. And, and I think also now the fact that uh, it's also not very affordable to many people. So they're like, what's the point? What's the point of having this conversation? It's for Yeah, mm-hmm. if they say it's, it's not a thing for me. So that, that could be a thing. But I'm sure there's more. Yeah. There's this thing about, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for an extended period of time, you find that uh, people who are not, like they don't have a lot of money to their name, um, they're struggling, living hand to mouth, day to day, struggle. They do not have time to think about self actualization. Mm-hmm. They're thinking about where am I going to get the next meal. And so, conversations about uh, mm-hmm. belonging, love, uh, self approach, your security, all these things become secondary conversation. And then, um, with, with um, right now, there's a lot of wealth that has come up in the last century. People are putting a lot of money. Uh, people are continuing to, the world has continued to get uh, people out of poverty, more people out of poverty, um, compared to what it was back in the day. And it may not look like it when you look around, but it's a thing globally when you look at the statistics, it shows that more and more people are getting out of poverty. And so, if more and more people are getting out of poverty, they're getting out of the hand to mouth living, mm-hmm. they're getting out of the conversation of what am I going to eat, they're not in the bottom part of the, um, the higher the pyramid, mm-hmm. yeah, the pyramid. Mm-hmm. they're not an opportunity, they're able to uh, start thinking about these higher order things, mm-hmm. these things about uh, what is my purpose in life, where am I supposed to be heading to, uh, why do I feel depressed, why do I feel anxious because of experience, they're no longer just thinking about, they, they're not constantly um, in their head about the next meal. Mm-hmm. It's not survival. So the problem is that when you get out of survival mode, now you have a new, a new, a new problem. Mm-hmm. You are no longer in survival mode, so now you have to deal with the problems of living in a balance. Mm-hmm. And that is something you're not prepared for when you're in survival mode. Mm-hmm. And that becomes, uh, that, that's why the conversations are not being had a lot more, because there's more people mm-hmm. who are no longer in survival mode, and then now they are faced with the realities of your emotional life, mm-hmm. your, your personal life that does not require you to constantly distract yourself with um, the, the problems of daily living, mm-hmm. next meal, mm-hmm. next uh, rent, next things like that. Now you're thinking about uh, what is the meaning of life and why am I here, what was I born, what, what am I doing in this life? Yeah, yeah that can be very, um, you, you're unprepared for it, and then that becomes a problem for you. So yeah, I think we need to be prepared about how to live outside of survival. Um, at the end of the day, when you're done with um, Struggling for survival, you've gotten your meal and you've eaten and now you've settled. There's that mm-hmm. bit of time between the moment you get into bed and the time you fall asleep, mm-hmm. and that can be a good time to yeah. yeah. And everybody, every human being gets the opportunity for that. I don't think anybody um, is robbed of that yet. Mm-hmm. And, and um, if we can take that time, even if you're in survival mode, it's okay. Mm-hmm. But if you can take that time to just think about your life and to think about the things that um, could improve it, could take that time to reflect, uh, to think about the future, um, it could be something. I'm not saying it's going to solve all your problems, mm-hmm. but it could be something. Yeah. It never hurts to take care of your mental health, no matter which station of life you're in. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's, it's a win-win if you take care of your mental health. Yeah, yeah I think sure. that's a big deal. So what, what are some of the things that bring out 
bring about mental health challenges in an individual? What are some of the conditions that kind of, you know, maybe introduce or amplify um, negative mental health? Um, there are several of them. One of them being um, exposure to um, experiences that are very uh, traumatic. So, like, if you live in a place where there's constant war, there's con- constant uh, insecurity, constant fear, um, constant violence, even in the family setup, children were born in families that are constantly fighting with one reason or another, those things can be detrimental to your mental health because you are in constant fight or flight uh, or freeze sometimes. And so um, there's no room for you to experience good health when you are constantly fighting, fighting or freezing. You're constantly activated. And stress hormones are in your system constantly. And we all know what stress hormones do to your body and to your mind. So um, exposure to those um, uh, ne- negative experiences, exposure to those traumatic experiences can be damaging. Um, exposure to stressors can be damaging. Um, if you're constantly stressed about one thing or another, you're working in an environment that does not support your mental health, that can be problematic. Um, Genetic genetic factors are included there. There are some things that can be passed from one generation to another. Um, they are not as big as you imagine them to be, but they are part of it. Such as? Uh, schizophrenia can be passed from okay. one family member to the next. Mm-hmm. Uh, genetic can be a generational thing. Uh, so some mental health issues can be passed on the card. Bipolar as well. Uh, several things can happen. But but also remember, um, beyond them being passed down, there's also the, now the environmental mm-hmm. things that uh, perpetuate perpetu- perpetu- them, the things that make them worse. Traumatic experiences and environmental stressors can be contributors to um, the, the uh, genetic factor. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean that because there's a genetic component to it that you're going to get mm-hmm. into a mental mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just like diabetes. You may have it in the family, but it doesn't mean that you get it. Yeah. yeah. So there are things you can do about it. Um, definitely, the other thing that is big is things like physical illness, especially when you're you have a physical illness that uh, is very um, damaging to your body. Mm-hmm. So uh, you are never in, in a good place. You constantly worry about your health or it's, it's a painful situation to be in and there's nothing that can be done. Terminal illnesses can be also very scary and can send you to a very dark place. Um, or, or having uh, an, an illness, let's say an illness that uh, will not kill you now, but it will take you some time and you are uncertain about when mm-hmm. and you're constantly having to worry about that illness. Mm-hmm. That can be very... Uh, damaging because you're constantly anxious. You don't know, am I going to die in a year? Am I going to die in three months? And yeah, that can be very scary. But people get through these things because of the resilience that we have as human beings. Mm. Yeah, it's very possible to be able to um, develop resilience and, and prepare yourself for things. But even if you don't prepare yourself, at least you know how to live on a day basis. Mm. And yeah, just live in a lot of gratitude. Um, something else that I think is very big is uh, lack of healthy relationships. Um, there's, there are studies in the African Center that talk about the fact that uh, healthy relationships are the number one contributor to general health and wealth mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, life. If you are living in a place where you have no healthy relationships, even if it's one or two people, you are going to struggle immensely. Like it's so under, underlooked, it's unbelievable. Yeah. But healthy relationships can get you through some of the toughest things in life. That is so, it's true because mm-hmm. I, I think about. The, the, just like when we started, you were talking about the loneliness. Yes. And because I've studied abroad, I have experienced the, that that feeling of not really having people who you can relate with. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, with students abroad, there's a lot of loneliness mm-hmm. generally. That's a conversation amongst uh, people. Yes. Yeah, amongst international students that is so big. Um, something that they always have to uh, encounter. They, they always have to deal with. Uh, so and and I think that it contributes a lot to the struggle abroad. That you know it spirals into so many other things. Yeah. Uh, when you're in that lonely, when you're in a lonely environment, in a sense, because you don't have that security. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's really interesting. So how can one support somebody struggling with mental health issues? Uh, if if you have somebody in your life who's struggling with a mental health issue, empathy is a big deal. Um, when somebody comes up and says, uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sad or I'm going through X, Y, and Z because of this thing that didn't happen or this thing that happened and I'm feeling really down, I don't know how to handle this thing. Your first answer should not be, but look at your life. Mm-hmm. You're so happy. Mm-hmm. You have so many things going on. Why would you focus on this one thing? You're so negative. 
that should not be your answer. And it's a very common answer. Or we go like, even me, I was struggling last week, what? I struggled, it was bad, it got me to depression, I almost got fired because I was depressed. Nobody wants to hear your horror story. Mm. That is not the time. Do not start sharing your story about, unless they specifically ask you, have you experienced this and how did you go about it? And even then, your horror story is unnecessary. I promise you, it doesn't help. Yeah. So yeah, there's that part where we have to be uh, very aware of the way we respond to people. Don't invalidate people's experiences because you had a less experience with or a worse experience. Mm-hmm. Do not invalidate people's experiences. Uh, that is not the time to tell them that they have things to be grateful for mm-hmm. because that makes them feel guilty for struggling. They're like, am I ungrateful? Am I, is, am I just a bad person? Is there, what is wrong with me? Why can't I be grateful like everybody else and not uh, complain? There are people who are trust me. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you broke your leg and somebody else uh, broke their arm, you don't go like, what? You're in more pain than me. Mm-hmm. You go like, I am in pain. Mm-hmm. And when you go to hospital, they don't say that this person has more rights to be able mm-hmm. to, to complain about their pain than the other person. So that's not the time to um, share your other stories. That's not the time to validate people. Listen, listen, listen. Listening is an important skill. Validate the experience. Uh, you don't have to give an, a, 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 an answer if they are not looking for an answer. It's okay to ask for what they, uh, to ask them what they need so that you can offer support the way they need it. So there's also this thing uh, where we are constantly saying, um, do to others as you want them to do to you. And um, we keep forgetting that we are not alone. That is a very good phrase, but it is only good for some things, but not for everything. There are situations where you don't want to do things uh, to people that they will do to you because you're not alone. Do to them what they need you to do to them. So if they need your support in X, Y, and Z way, meet them where they are. Don't go like, if I was in a situation, I would have wanted X, Y, and Z. You're not. And that is not time for you to talk about your situation. So meeting people where they are, being very empathetic, being, being very understanding. Uh, a big one for me is always connecting people to resources. Um, you might not know everything, but you know something. And connecting people to that something, that resource that could make the situation later, if that is what they're looking for, is a good thing. Again, remember, what do they need? Meet them where they are. That is how you support somebody with a mental health challenge. Meet them where they are. It's not the time to bring your stories. Mm-hmm. Please don't. Um, so yeah, I, it's very important for empathy. It's very important for, um, for understanding, for putting yourself in their shoes. Um, for offering people the help they need, meeting them where they are, and connecting them to resources, um, being open to go with them to uh, seek su- uh, support if they want to go um, to see a mental health professional. You're welcome to ask if they want you to come with them, and if they, they can feel supported in that way. So again, meeting them where they are, what do they need, and how can you support them? Yeah, I think it's important. For empathy is the biggest one. Yeah, empathy is the biggest one. Yeah. It's interesting that one came up with uh, a personal trainer not too long ago is the lack of empathy in the fitness industry mm. because there's those phrases like go hard or go home. Yeah. Um, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think it goes in line with a lot of what you're saying, which there's that lack of empathy, I think, generally, where we place our expectations on other people. Yeah. And Sometimes, even as a fitness professional, you can project your own expectations of what someone else should be able to do, but you're basing it off of your love and passion and dedication to fitness, whereas yeah. not everyone is going to be as passionate about fitness as you are, yeah. even if there are benefits to being uh, engaged in your personal fitness, you know? Yeah, yeah. and it's very possible to actually um, alienate people when you're yes. telling them to go hard or go home. Yes. Uh, first of all, there are people who are ready to go home. Yes. Hi. <laughs> From people. Um, and, and, and again, it's that thing, remember when we spoke about um, having your own values mm-hmm. and knowing why you're doing the things you're doing. If my goal is not to do the things that you think I should be doing, then you tell me to go hard or go home. Exactly. I will choose what works best for me. Exactly. Yeah, and I might be in, in the fitness world because I just want uh, I, to lose five kgs, let's say for I want to lose five kgs. And you have the impression mm-hmm. that for my success for me to be considered a success story in the fitness world, I need to lose thirty. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that I should conform to your standard of success? So if I know what my goals are and my values are, I'll be able to be confident in my decision to say that is not my goal. Thank you for thinking that I should have that goal. But I, I am not going there and it's fine. And you will not be swayed and you'll not feel pressured to conform to things that are not aligning with your values. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's very important for people to have an idea of why they do the things they do. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll be forced to go for goals that are not yours. Mm-hmm. And then you're constantly distressed because you're doing things that you completely hate yeah. and things that do not align with any of your values in life. And you're like, 
Why am I here? Yes. I could be home right now. Yeah. Yeah. And the burnout kicks in real quick. Yes, yes, um, yes. So moving along, do you, are there gender differences in the ways mental health struggles manifest? Um, I think one of the reasons I, I brought up this gender differences issue is side note. Um, I find that when we talk about mental health, uh, I don't know if it's, yeah, I, don't, I don't know the statistics behind it, but I think if you've lived long enough, you notice that women tend to be a bit more in touch with their emotions than men are. I guess it's just how we're built. Um, maybe not, I don't know, you can let us know. But And then also I find that a lot of counsellors tend to be women. Uh, it's, not, it's not that easy to find male counsellors out there. Um, could you touch on that as we talk about maybe some of the ways mental health struggles might manifest differently? between genders. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. First of all, this is going to feel like a rant. Forgive me in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me in advance, especially in the part where uh, we talk about mental health professionals, most of them being women. Mm-hmm. And um, I was reading this thing about uh, the feminization of um, professions mm-hmm. and what it means for those professionals. So you find that, um, let's say for example, in the med- medical world, there are many doctors who are male and there are very many nurses who are women. Mm-hmm. And there's the expectation that um, women will be caregivers in whatever profession they go into. And the problem with that is that once women are seen as the caregivers and they, they are considered to be um, doing it for the love of the work, uh, there's a likelihood that they can be exploited financially because they're, uh, you can be paid less. And if you're paid less, then it means you're also struggling to uh, become uh, a player in the global field when it comes to finances and being a decision maker financially in your household. And um, the other problem is that it locks out men who are passionate about the jobs. Mm-hmm. So it makes it hard for men who want to be in the helping professions to come in because you're thinking it's a woman's job and they're not a woman. So um, somebody was saying felt something funny about how um, where they work, uh, nurses are called sisters. Mm-hmm. And so when there's a male nurse, people are always confused about uh, what she should I call her. Yeah, because they're like, ah, yeah. what do I call you now? Yeah. So there's that feminization of professions that makes it easy for women to be exploited. Mm-hmm. And you find that um, if, if women are not on the decision making table when decisions are being made, it means that a huge 50% of the population is being let out, their voices are not being heard. And then that becomes a problem on the, on, in the entire world because if 51% of the population is not being represented, uh, what, how is it the minority is the one that gets to run everything? Mm-hmm. So there's that problem, it's a gender differences issue. And um, then, then, of course, um, the burden of the workforce with the women. So you find that there's so many women who are mental health professionals. Uh, men do not seek mental health professionals because they see um, that it's only women. Women do not understand the problem. So why would I go and speak to a woman who is going to really see my, my life differently from theirs? Um, it, it touches on so many things at the same time. And so it also makes it, it makes it very difficult for the men who are in the profession to do their job well. Because they are thinking, I'll always be compared to the female, female standard because the female standard is being seen as the standard of care. So um, if, if a, a client comes in and they think it's a man, they may not treat me the same way they would treat a woman. Mm-hmm. The same way if you go to hospital and you find the doctor is a woman, mm-hmm. you don't treat them the same way that you treat a man. Because in your head you thought a doctor is a man mm-hmm. and a nurse is a woman. Mm-hmm. So there's that expectation that things are going to look a certain way. Yeah. So they put people in a box mm-hmm. and they make work very difficult. And then there's a lot of value now on the women. Because then again, um, if, if, if women are seen as lesser being, if women are seen as uh, lesser professionals, if the work of a mental health professional is seen as a simple job mm. that can be done by women, then it is seen as a trivial job. Yeah. So if the job is trivial and it's being done by women, yes. then it means women are trivial. Yeah. Yeah. So it touches on so many things at yeah, the same time. Because I can also see how now that means that I don't need to address mental health because it's just this, by the way. It's a women's thing. Yeah, it's a women's thing because women like to talk. So. Yeah let them go into their yeah. rooms and talk about their problems. Yeah. yeah. And then now mental health is made a gender issue. Yes. And there is a problem with the term gender issue, because when we say gender issue, people think gender issue is a women's issue. Mm. It's very rare to hear gender issue and hear men in yeah, yeah. Because you talk about gender di- diversity, yes. you're always thinking women. women yeah. and it, is, it is planted in your mind that gender is a women's term. Mm. Gender is not seen as a term for gender. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it distresses the job, it makes the job harder, it makes it harder for men to come to therapy, and when they come to therapy, they think they're weak, mm-hmm. and they think they're missing up their weak population because it's women, and mm-hmm. it's a trivial job. Mm-hmm. And so if it's a trivial job, and women are trivial, 
the payment is also going to the very children because mm. as a woman and you're doing a trivial job why would you charge me x amount of money for a trivial thing like talking to a therapist it becomes a very problematic thing it's such a bad cycle <laughs> it, is, it is horrible it is horrible yeah. it makes it makes mental health such a difficult thing to do yeah. because now mental health professionals are overworked mm. they are tired they are underappreciated and their work is seen as less yeah. and then it becomes even very hard to engage in relationships with the with men when you are in the profession because mm-hmm. they see work as less uh, yeah so even if you're in a household that is a true income household and you are doing the mental health job and the person thinks that your job is trivial they're like your contribution is very mm-hmm. yeah they're like this it's just a, it's yeah. Like a hobby yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and so people don't see it as a serious job mm-hmm. so when they come to therapy they're like ah okay i'm just gonna come and just you know so okay. it becomes very problematic mm-hmm. yeah and so the other thing is on the um Gender differences when it comes to uh, accessing mental health. You think that societal, societal expectations on women are that uh, you are allowed to uh, go and speak about emotions. So if women are allowed to speak the, about the emotions and they are allowed to cry, they are allowed to go ahead and talk to anyone to express themselves. Of course, not all sides of woman, womanhood is supposed to express so anger is from the point because why well, would you be an angry woman? Um, there are some things you are limited to expressing certain emotions and you are allowed to express them. And so it means women access mental health easily because for them um, they are open to discussing their issues. And even if they need to address, address them uh, with a mental health professional, they'll address it with their friends mm-hmm. because we are allowed to talk about our issues. For men, you are not allowed to talk about your issues because if you talk about them, it's a sign of weakness. Why are you not man enough? Man enough, you will go to handle your things. On a man in Chikaza, Chikaza. And so it becomes very difficult when you eventually show your emotional side. And the problem is that um, our our um, our society approving of women to present themselves the way they do and limiting emotional expression in men yes. makes it very difficult for men and women to engage mm-hmm. because um, as a man you're presenting one side, as a woman I'm presenting another side, and some sides of me are acceptable, others are not acceptable, and so if I am only acceptable when I am X Y and Z, it means I have to treat my own authenticity for that acceptance. I have to act such a way so that I can be acceptable. And so it means I am living a very small life, a very small emotional life, because only a certain number of my emotional expressions are allowed. And so I never become fully human. And when I present, as a man, if I present um, my other side of being, guys don't want to do it. They're like, now you've started crying. Yes. If, um, if, if I am dealing with a man, and this man will not show me all his sides, then I am only dealing with parts of him mm-hmm. and parts of parts don't make the whole. I need to see the whole you so that I know what to do with the whole you. Mm-hmm. And the whole you requires you to show all emotions. And the problem is that if you numb some emotions, you numb all emotions. Akunanga mm-hmm. ati, I can numb my sadness and feel joy. Mm-hmm. You don't. So with mental health in general, you numb an emotion, you numb all emotions. Mm-hmm. There is nothing like pick and choose. It's not a buffet. Mm-hmm. And, that, and people get it, they think that uh, if I can work on just this one, if I can work on my anger and just uh, bring it down and uh, shut it out. But anger is an important emotion. Mm. If there's no anger, you won't know when you're being taken advantage of. Yes. Yeah. And so um, there's the misconception that there's some emotions that are good and emotions that are bad. Mm. But there's no good or bad emotions. There are emotions yes. and there's reaction. And if only some emotions are allowed to be seen, mm-hmm. then it means you're only seeing parts of people. Yeah. And they have to hide the other parts so that you can accept them. And so they, we are never dealing with the real person. Exactly. We are dealing with a caricature. Mm-hmm. We are never dealing with a real human. It's always a presented something we have created. Yeah. And then we are like, okay, here is something. Please accept my humble offering mm-hmm. of parts of me mm-hmm. that are good enough. Yeah. And we are constantly not chasing that perfection and that good enough because we are never worthy. Mm-hmm. Our, our entire humanity is not worthy. Mm-hmm. No, we, are, we feel unworthy, and so we present only the parts that will be seen as worthy. And that brings a lot, a lot of problems. I, I like saying that we are moving away from that thing of men cannot be themselves. Mm. And I don't like, yes, we talk about how the society is set up right now that men cannot do X, Y, and Z. But I also want to point out that that is not the case all the time. It's not the case everywhere. There are a lot of men right now who are showing a lot of their emotions. There are a lot of men who are coming up and being authentic. And we cannot forget to highlight those men because they are setting the way. They are, they are opening up. And if um, more men can get on that bandwagon, then it becomes easier to deal with mental health challenges among men. Um, so the excuse of um, men are not allowed, 
may not be the first man who does it. Mm. Be the first man who does it and be confident in yourself that you will get through whatever backlash will come at you because you are you you are doing what needs to be done for you to be human. A human being has a bazillion cells mm-hmm. and they are all good enough, they are all worthy. Mm-hmm. And if you don't bring them, we don't know them. Yeah. And so when you act in X, Y, and Z way, we don't know how to handle you. Mm-hmm. But if we knew this was part of who you are, yeah. we would know how to handle you. Mm-hmm. So um a call to action of men, please. <laughs> the excuse of men are not allowed to uh, be the first one. Yeah. Be the first one and then set away for the other men who are around you. Mm-hmm. Be the first one to um to show kindness to your fellow men mm-hmm. so that they know that kindness is not a woman's trait. Mm-hmm. Kindness is a human trait. Yes. Yeah, because uh, be the first one who gives your, your male friends hugs and kindness. <laughs> yeah, I, I know sometimes it's frowned upon, <laughs> but you, you, you want a hug. We can tell you want a hug. <laughs> But, so be the one who gives the first hand. Yeah. Don't wait for the other person who might also be feeling awkward. Yeah. So when um, there's a sense of um, there's a degree of security in yourself and in, in the place you are in the world that enables you to take risks mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So if you feel that as a man you're going to a place where you have enough security to take that kind of a risk, mm-hmm. be the first one to take that risk. Yeah. yeah. So actually, so I I took I took a moment the other day uh, to ask uh, the people on the people who follow my page. To, if you were to ask a, a mental health professional anything, what would you ask? And one question that came up was how to deal with the lack of motivation. Yeah. Um, I don't think you find motivation. I think it finds you when you're doing something. So there's a school of thought in psychology that insists that um, motivation follows action. Mm. So you get up and you do things, whether you want them, whether you want to do them or not, and motivation will find you. So there's that one school of thought, and then there's the the, the the one where that comes in as a joke when you are you, uh, I don't know if you've seen this guy who's riding a bicycle and there's a bear running behind him mm. and so the bear is chasing you you will have motivation to ride yeah. nobody will be able to tell you yeah, sure. and that is an external uh, that is external motivation the problem with external motivation is that it runs out mm-hmm. if you're waiting for things to become motivating for you for you to do things then you can end up in a place where you're constantly chasing the next high. Because you're constantly looking for something to give you the energy for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And those things are can be few and far between, or they can lead you to get addicted to things. Mm-hmm. And again, as we said, addiction is not just about drugs, it can be anything. So um motivation external motivation is good to a degree. It's the same way that um you'll find that employers will give uh, rewards when you achieve a certain goal, but they're not given all the time mm-hmm. because they can become like a crutch. And if they are not there, people don't do anything. And the other part is that if they're given too often, they become meaningless. So if you're waiting for external motivation to constantly be there so that you can do things, you will find yourself uh, falling behind on a lot of your goals in life because motivation does not care about you and motivation is very short-lived. Mm. Motivation uh, does not sustain you. It's work that uh, consistency is what sustains you. Motivation just can get you started, but it's not a requirement. So I think we give a lot of power to motivation that it does not deserve. Motivation is just like a, it's like um, spices in food. You can eat your food without spices and you won't die. Mm. But spices are nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's there's nothing bad with having a bit of spice in your food. So um there's internal motivation as well, which is also a good one. I think internal motivation is always awesome because it, it is tied to a value. Mm-hmm. When it is set to a value is a good one, not when it is set to a goal. Because you can always achieve goals and then there's nothing else to do. Um if your goal is to become the fastest uh, runner in the world. When you achieve it, then what? Yeah. Yeah, because that's an external goal. Mm-hmm. And yes, internally you're feeling that this is something that you really want and it is pu- pushing you. But when you achieve it, then what? So um, I highly encourage people to tie their motivation to um, values, not to goals, not to things outside of themselves. Mm-hmm. What are you working towards? And what, what is the easiest way to get there? And let your motivation direct you. But at the end of the day, as I say, motivation can come from different places. Different people um, get motivation from different sources. Yeah? There's some people who need to just listen to a motivational speaker and they're ready to go. Um, some people need to see their friends doing something and they're ready to go. Some people need an accountability partner for them to get motivated to do something. Um, some people now need to be running away from some form of pain yeah. and then they can get going. Some people need to be running towards some form of success story and then they'll get going. Mm-hmm. So motivation looks different for different people. But I would highly, highly encourage do things that are valuable to you, things that are aligned with your values, and you won't need to seek out motivation. Because when you wake up in the morning, you will be like, uh, is this value that, I really, that is really important to me, and I need to do X, Y, and Z? There's no matter how I feel, this is important to me, and I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. I love it. And um, yeah, even when you have like a job, you're not going to like every aspect of that job. And some aspects will be motivating and others won't. And it is okay. Mm-hmm. Because 
Again, motivation is fleeting. So let's stop giving motivation too much power that does not deserve. It is nice, but it is not an essential thing to make you do the things you need to do. You can get up and do the things that you set up to do that align with your values, and the motivation will find you going and you can go. Yeah. Sound like a very good personal trainer. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna try, I'm gonna add that to my career. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> she think about adding that to your repertoire. Serio, huh? Yeah, because because it, it did sound like some of the things fitness clients need to hear mm-hmm. as well. Um, it's very in line with how we ought to look at physical fitness as yeah. well. It's all the same, the same understanding, the same underlying, um, the same underlying workings of what it takes to be consistent with your fitness journey. So I, yeah. I resonate with that, yeah. with that message. Because I think also, um, even even in, in on those days that people who love training train, mm-hmm. you don't love training all the time. Yeah. You, you wake up some days and you're like, ah, no, not today. Yeah. And if you're waiting for motivation to strike so that you can go to the gym, mm-hmm. you will never go to the gym. Yeah. Because the body loves uh, things that are simple. Mm-hmm. The body does not like struggling. Yeah. Yeah. So the body can be like, ah, so you just stay here. Yeah. So you just stay here today. Yeah. So you just stay there. Because yeah. on the rainy days. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Why get out of this place? <laughs> That's all but then, yeah. So if you're waiting for motivation to strike so that you can do things, yeah. trust me, you never do anything. Yeah. And that's why you need, sometimes, as I said, sometimes external motivation is good mm-hmm. and it should not be the only motivation. Sometimes internal motivation is good. Mm-hmm. It should not be the only motivation. Yeah. Your values should be the leading factor. What are the values and how do, how do, how do I meet those values on a basis? Mm-hmm. Motivation can come through or not come through and I'll still be fine. Mm-hmm. I'll still be okay. Yeah. yeah. True that. Um, so, uh, lastly, uh, but not least, I would love for you to give us some resources um, that you think would be helpful for people who might be looking to address their mental health. Um, some, 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 and when I say resources, this can range from, I mean, whatever, whatever you think can help anyone yeah. who wants to get on that on that path to understanding themselves better, understanding their path, understanding, you know, just getting a, a better sense of their place, uh, their mental health, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, I am a high, I'm a big advocate for people getting what I call therapeutic aids. So not everybody will have the opportunity to go to therapy. Um, maybe because you don't have the time, it takes time to go to therapy. Um, maybe you don't have the money, you don't have uh, access to a therapist. So therapeutic resources, the therapeutic aids are a big deal for me. And those include uh, things that you watch, things that you listen to, things that you read, uh, people that you interact with. Those can be therapeutic aids. So it can be like uh, your own, you, you're doing therapy for yourself through the things that are around you. Uh, those can be um, books that you read. I, I love How to Read the Work by Dr. Nicole Rivera. It's a very good book, very well written. Uh, so much uh, value in that book. Go read it or go listen to YouTube videos that have summarized it. Um, you're going to get value out of it because if you know how to do the work, then you're working towards your self awareness. And uh, self awareness is the funding thing, it's the Swiss knife. So you have to uh, build a self awareness, everything else just falls apart because mm-hmm. you don't know where you're going. You don't know your values because you don't know who you are. So you can't know your values. So yeah. Uh, Dr. Nicole Perez has written that good book, How to Do the Work. Um, what other book I would recommend is um, books on setting boundaries are really, really good so that you learn yourself, you learn um, what works for you and what doesn't work for you so that you know how to say no to things, how to say yes, uh, when you need to have rigid uh, uh, boundaries, when you have to, when you need uh, more flexible boundaries, when you, how to set healthy boundaries. I think those things are important. Um, if you are into, if you want to learn more about addictions and especially uh, substance use issues, you can check out Nakada. Nakada website has a lot of resources from substance use. And the good thing about um, substance use resources is that they can apply to other other kinds of addictions. Mm-hmm. So when you read something about substance use, uh, you can flip it into whatever addiction you're dealing with mm-hmm. or whatever su- issue you're going, you're going through that is making your life less than ideal. Mm-hmm. And you can use those resources. So that's why I think um, the EHS program works well because um, it it applies to almost every addiction in life. So the first the first one just admitting that whatever you're going through is beyond you. You can never you can you have no control over it. Uh, that is something that could apply to so many things. So think about whatever you're going through right now and how you can apply some of those resources from Akana to your life. 
Um, something else I think is important is to check out the free mental health resources. If you don't have money to go to a therapist, this is not the time to we, we are past the story at Snapesa. You can always go and get free therapy services. And if you're in Nairobi, especially, NMS has free counseling uh, resources in almost every hospital. But I, uh, I, will, I will share a link to some of those uh, documents so that you have an access an idea of where to find these places. Um, so NMS is a thing. You can go to Matari Hospital. Um, KNH has a mental health thing for young people. Easy to say, please just apply yourself to yeah. research. Um, something else that I think is important is that these helplines these days. So you can check out the helplines that exist. And with the helplines, you can find a uh, like spiritual therapist. Even if they won't give you 25 sessions, at least they give you a session and listen to you and help you brainstorm some solutions to your current problem. So check out Red Cross helpline. Uh, Befriend us Kenya have a helpline, especially for suicide issues. So check out that. Um, something else I think that is important is to Google a lot. Make Google your second best friend after your mental health. Um, Google whatever you're going through at this moment. And you're going to find a bazillion of resources about it. You're going to find so many things about it and allow yourself to go through that rabbit hole. And remember, um, when it comes to changing things, don't expect that just because you're Google today and you found the, the resource, it's going to be mm-hmm. immediate, the effect will be immediate, put upon us, and you'll give you your issues, you'll become self aware immediately, mm-hmm. and you'll get an A. That is not how it works. These things take time, a long time, because remember, they took time to become the things they are right now. Maybe you're dealing with things from your childhood. And you're about 25. That is 25 years of constant, constant repetition of the same problem. So it will take time to deal with this problem, and it is okay. It's okay for you to give yourself the grace, the time to go through whatever you need to go through. And yeah, I think that is an important aspect. And I think yeah, I think with that, it's very important that you reach out those resources, apply yourself, jitume, and and be willing to go through the process of healing and becoming better in your natural journey. Mm. Yeah. Very helpful. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I really appreciate it. Um, Again, I think it's so interesting the way you put that last part because that's how I learned about fitness is the random googling, yes. accepting like to go down that rabbit hole, and also learning that things take time. You talk like a personal trainer, like, uh, it's and, and I think <laughs> maybe it's not it's not that you talk like a personal trainer. It's that these principles that guide all these things. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I think maybe that's something that is not highlighted well enough. Um, and hopefully with these conversations we will do a better job at helping people understand just how interrelated all these things are, which is why I'm so happy you have come to represent the mental health side of things because that's how I've looked at it for the longest time is that it's all one, just like our bodies are one thing, yeah. you know, our, our legs can't do something when our brain says no, you know, so it's, it's, it's all so connected and it's all so... Um, we have to we have to approach it holistically, um, and so we can't overemphasize one or the other. Because on the other hand, I've also seen people who overemphasize the whole mental health thing, and I think maybe that's where some people might be turned off by the conversation. At yeah. least I know there's moments where I've been turned off by the conversation where there's people who overemphasize the they're too much in their heads mm. sometimes, and that can also be a problem. Yeah, just like someone who's too much into their physical appearance, that can also be an issue. So it's all about this balance. We're all, I think we're constantly trying to figure out that balance of of trying to find a, that holistic way where we can be healthy all around. Yeah. And that's why I think all these conversations sound so similar. It's because the patients, the, the research, the accepting help, the, all these different things that you mentioned so eloquently. They all work on all sectors of this whole conversation. So I'm really glad we got a chance to, to talk about this. So before we finish, do you mind just giving us your social media handles where people can find you once more, um, all that good stuff. Yeah, um, so thank you for having me and I hope this has been a valuable uh, piece of information, content for whoever is going to be listening. And um, you can find Infinity Wellness Consultants on every social media platform, um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, it's either you see Africa, that's what we call ourselves. But the title is the same, is I Infinity Wellness Consultants. And so that is for anybody who's looking to if you're a mental health professional listening to this and you want to get featured on the show, uh, if you want to get uh, connected to um, a mental health professional's network, 
Uh, that's a place you can check out. Um, you can check out Safe Space Arena. It's Safe Space Arena on every platform. And as I said, we have mental health resources for general people, and we have mental health resources for beginner therapists. Um, yeah, buy my book. Uh, support starving artists. <laughs> um, and and um, that's for mental health professionals. So the Safe Space Arena, dear beginner therapist. Okay. Yes, it's a handbook for mental health professionals. Available on Amazon. And if you want to buy it locally, you don't go to Amazon. Come to my DM, I will uh, connect you to the book. Um, yeah, social media, find me there. Those are the handles, Safe Space Arena and Infinity Wellness Consultants. And um, you can check out the website as well, safespacearena.wordpress.com. The, uh, the, we have so many resources there, information about addiction, information about uh, social media addiction and issues around social media, uh, creatives, access to resources for creatives. There's an entire podcast if you are creative listening. Please come through and interview you. Um, yeah, that's a call to action for creatives. So yeah, that's that's where to find me. That's the work I do. Um, if you DM me or if you send me an email, I will respond in 48 hours or less, hopefully or less, but mostly 48 hours. So I think that's an important part. I'm not ignoring you if I don't respond <laughs> in 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are not constantly chatting. Yeah. I am not the biggest uh, chatter. I don't uh, use social media like that. Mm. So if you DM or whatever email you send, probably 48 hours. Uh, I check my email that often, um, or one of the people running the social media courses is going to talk to you. So yeah, come to nice. uh, Hopefully, like she said, this episode has been helpful to you. Check out all those resources. Uh, until next time, uh, we'll be continuing these conversations with other professionals. Your mental health matters as well, just as much as your physical. So hopefully these conversations will continue to help you develop more than just your biceps and your abs. Because uh, we want to be a whole human who is functional, healthy and happy. And that's why this FitCast exists. So all the best out there. And until the next episode, we'll see you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Shuja FitCast. For more information and business inquiries, email us at shujafitnesswarrior at gmail.com. Follow us on social media at shuja underscore fitness on Instagram, at shuja fitness on Facebook and TikTok, and subscribe to our channel at shuja fitness on YouTube. For audio versions of this podcast, check us out on Spotify, Boomplay, and Apple Podcasts. This show was recorded and produced at the Represented Studio in Nairobi, Kenya. Special thanks to Lucid for the background music.